And speak first I shall, my lord Jinak, Felicity replied with a gracious tone. At the risk of sounding arrogant for speaking the truth, my lord, I ask thee, what can you expect to gain from a duplicitous murderer that brought ruination to so many houses not even a decade ago? All the pain she caused through the application of a mere whim, confused as justice delivered? Wyatt was stunned at the bluntness of the black-haired woman was using. He glanced at Cynthia, expecting to find her clenching her fists or barely being able to contain her rage. To his surprise, though, she remained calm and collected. While he couldn't see Clara's expression, her body language showcased a demure yet unshakable posture. Why put your trust in such a devious woman, royal or not, in these tumultuous times? The black-haired woman's tone never faltered, always showcasing a measured politeness that, puzzlingly, was never betrayed by her harsh words. His Lord Regent, Duke Canerlius Draymore, wishes to impose order and stability that could not be gained from such a weak prince. He wishes not to depose his nephew, but to guide the principality with his firm, steady, and powerful hand until a true prince may take the throne. To believe that his lordship wishes to take it for himself is but folly, a lie propagated by unfit and blinded followers of one who would drive the principality to ruin, Felicity finished with a soft, coquettish smile. Jinnok nodded and turned his attention to the blonde woman. Princess Clara, how do you reply? Unfazed by Felicity's words, Clara replied gently. These truly are tumultuous times, I agree in this regard with Lady Felicity. However, have you forgotten that my uncle, Cornelius Draymore, brought it upon us all? He spoke an impassioned speech before the Council of Nobles. Even I considered his reasonings, but they were not enough to sway the Council. What did he do in response to their denial to declare him Lord Regent? He betrayed us all. How many hundreds of lives were lost in his initial move to seize the throne through a coup? How long had he been preparing for such an assault? These black ships were not produced within the principality, who produced and transported them to the Duke's territory. Her purple eyes settled on Felicity, piercing her with cold indifference. You call me duplicitous, Lady Felicity, but I am not the one who planned years in advance to strike against her family for the sake of power. Whatever truths my uncle spoke were tarnished by his actions. If Lord Jeanock must be wary of me due to my past actions, to be standoffish of the Reaper, she said as she swung her right arm slowly, imitating a scythe across the table's surface, then he must positively doubt every sentence that runs past your lips. How can anyone be sure to trust a betrayer, liar, and backstabber when it is proven he is not but a craven and a cheat? To Felicity's credit, she too remained unfazed by Clara's retort. Jeanock, for his part, hummed deeply. Princess Clara brings up a valid point, Lady Felicity. What assurances does my house have that Duke Draymore will not simply remove us from our ancestral lands and place his followers in our stead? He had moved against his family and prepared extensively for this coup beforehand. How can I side with Duke Draymore knowing that mine and my family's lives are at the shifting whims of a traitor? His Lord Regent, Felicity began, but was interrupted by Jeanock smacking the table with his bare palm. I do not recognize his claim as Lord Regent. The Council of Nobles didn't either. You will not use that title again or these negotiations shall end, Jeanock threatened in no uncertain terms. Felicity bowed her head slightly. Forgive my lack of oversight, Lord Jeanock. To us who follow his righteous path, he is anything but. Nevertheless, I shall acquiesce. His lordship, Duke Draymore, only wishes what's best for the principality. What great accomplishment has the prince done since the title was bestowed upon him? He has only sat on the throne, enjoying and feasting on the riches of his realm without doing anything. Why, Her Majesty, Princess Clara, has achieved more than her brother. Duke Draymore wants nothing more than to have a strong prince to guide the principality. Strong yet empty words, Clara countered. What I have done matters not. My brother, the prince, has not forced the council to elevate him in three years since the title was passed unto him. He never overreached nor abused his rightful authority. You ask what his achievements are? His achievements lie in maintaining strong relations between quarreling noble houses, ensuring that more resources and budget are directed to the fleets, encouraging technological development, and much more. Is peace not a worthy goal to strive for? 
Before my uncle betrayed him, he had plans to reach out to the Yikanti hierarchy and slowly cease the tense hostilities between our peoples. Felicity let out a soft scoff. Peace is a worthy goal, your majesty. How is it achieved? Well, that's another matter entirely. What more proof of weakness do you require, Lord Jinak? The prince wishes to bow down to our alien enemies before strengthening the principality. Duke Draymore wishes for us to be strong, to reclaim the territories lost, to push back against the damnable Drazen raiders and the threat the collective poses. Not to mention strike against the Arabian Commonwealth and end their threat forever, too. What can we expect with such a prince sitting on the throne of the principality? War? Famine? Economic recession? Countless rebellions and uprisings? The room went silent for several seconds as the two women stared at each other, unwilling to take a step back. Finally, it was Ishavi who broke the silence. Peace is indeed good for us all, but when that peace is threatened, it requires a strong prince to lead the principality, not an idealist who is easily deceived by his own kin, tragic as that tale may be. Lady Felicity speaks harsh truths, and they do not fall on deaf ears. Nevertheless, the issue of succession, and who is to sit on the throne matters little to House Ferentis. We wish to remain neutral in this conflict of interest as it is our right to do so, she said as her oldest son, Jolti, continued. House Ferentis is not known for its military might. We are not defenseless, but we are certainly not a powerhouse. Our diplomatic relations and proximity with houses Kasten, Rheinschein, and Finnegan have ensured that we do not need to focus on the fields of technology and military power. This has, to our great peril, meant that the patrols from the third and fourth fleets, now standing in opposition, are gone now. Our regular protectors and guardians have dispersed, following orders whilst many have left their posts in fear. This has largely left us without proper protection from invaders, organized pirate raids, and other incursions. My lord father, Genoch Ferentis, asks the following. What do you offer and what do you demand? Princess Clara, you shall speak first. Thank you, Lord Jolti, Clara began. I, Princess Clara Astor, second princess of the Astorian Principality, speaking as the voice of the prince and acting under his complete authority and most assiduous behalf, offer the following. House Astor and our allies offer a commercial pact with House Ferentis on matters of foodstuffs and other materials produced related to agricultural goods. This pact is to be exclusive in nature. No commerce of these same products shall be offered to the forces aligned with the treacherous Duke Cornelius Draymore. Breaching this pact would carry hefty fines and an immediate blockade by principality naval forces. In return, all goods shall be bought at an increased 15% base price, no tariffs on your behalf shall be demanded, and House Ferentis shall receive a 20-year-long 40% reduction on the payment of its due taxes. She stopped for a moment letting the weight of her offer to sink in. As for our demands, House Ferentis is to proclaim their support to the rightful ruler of the principality. The prince, reject all future diplomatic relations with enemy forces, refuse to house shelter, offer repair, or come to the aid of enemy forces in all aspects and areas, and denounce Duke Cornelius Draymore's treachery for what it is publicly. Wyatt felt a ball of iron form in his throat, but he refused to swallow it as the tension in the room was so thick he was sure he could reach out with a hand and grab it. As a commoner, he had been taught that nobles had absolute power and that royalty commanded them all without question. It was such a simple notion to understand and learn. Do as I say, because I'm above you. And yet, here was Clara a royal, and Aster, dealing with other powerful nobles that were, regardless of anything, beneath her. And yet instead of ordering them around, she was making deals, offering promises, and demanding only what felt reasonable. So this is what true diplomacy among nobles looks like. Dealing with Uriel Hulks was unnecessary. Clara wasn't threatening him at all. She was stating facts. And in Macha, the procession and the banquet were just displays of power and reason to make talk. But this? This is how insults can be spoken without worrying about consequences and lies and truth mingle into some twisted poison, Wyatt thought with a sense of apprehensive disgust. He knew that the lives and the plays of power between nobles weren't as simple as most commoners pictured in their heads. Mr. Warlow taught him that things were not so straightforward, no matter how much he wanted things to be so. 
And now that he'd seen it firsthand, he was finally starting to understand what being a noble meant and what the structure and balance of power was a delicate, shifting thing. Not something set in stone and immutable. He felt sick to his stomach for a moment, but his resolve purged it in favor of standing firm next to his friends, showing his support, no matter how insignificant it was. Javier Wunder scoffed before smiling a condescending smile. Pardon me, your majesty, but was that your best offer? He asked, his tone matching his expression. For if it was, then I'm afraid that House Astor shows their prepotency in full display. Or perhaps, is it fear? He let out a little laugh before continuing. A paltry sum of credits, a chain around the neck of an entire great house, and every minor and lesser house serving under the rightful rule of Lord Genoc, a bribe masqueraded as a reward, and an outrageous demand that would isolate them. If your underhanded attempts were not so brazen, I would applaud you, Reaper, he said, putting emphasis on the last word. Your proposed offer is generous at first glance, Princess, Janique agreed. However, I will not sign any treaty that forces my house to surrender its neutrality in this conflict. Exclusive trading rights I can consider as a manageable deal, nothing else. Tempting as the lower rate of taxes is, I'm afraid the answer is simple. I refuse this first proposal. Turning to Felicity, he waved his hand around. Lady Felicity, what does Duke Draymore offer and demand in turn? His lordship is a sensible man and generous to those that stand next to him but he is also a reasonable man who avoids putting his foot on the throat of those under his leadership. Lord Joaquin Ferentis, Duke Cornelius Draymore, offers an exclusive commercial pact in regard to foodstuffs and other assorted items to be provided to those loyal to him as true sons and daughters of the principality. He offers a most generous 25 base price upfront increase. However, you shall be allowed to retain your ability to deal with other neutral houses freely, only our deluded enemies are to be offered naught but ash to fill their bellies. And understanding your position of neutrality, his lordship will allow you to maintain your stance until the situation is resolved. The fetching woman stopped for a moment, her eyes landing on the man wearing a gray-colored armor so dark it might as well be black obsidian for a second or two before continuing. His lordship only demands that no harbor is to be given to his enemies and that you recognize his position as lord regent. She let out a tiny sigh as she finished. It is wondrous what a show of genuine respect and understanding can bring to the table, is it not, your majesty? Clara didn't reply. She merely kept her regal posture, unbending and ever focused. Hmm, your offer has merit, Lady Felicity. However, I, nor any member of House Ferentis, for that matter, shall recognize Duke Draymore as Lord Regent. The prince stands, this is a fact. His Majesty was going to be fully elevated by the Council of Nobles, which the Duke disrupted, and, as a child throwing a tantrum, moved to gain what he believed was rightfully his by force. Tell me, do the counselors yet live, his captured nieces and nephews? Do you expect me to support a man that by all intents and purposes is a traitor? Genoch asked, frowning. The counselors are alive and well. They are welcomed guests of his lordship, of course. So are their majesties, Princes Caldro and Leon, and their sisters, Princesses Megan and Ruby, Casimir replied proudly. So they are prisoners, Clara commented offhandedly. They are his lordship's guests, not prisoners. They are not being flogged or tortured for information. I assure you, your majesty, they are well tended and in perfect health. And even if they were prisoners, we are not like you and your followers, who delight in the use of brute force and any means necessary to extract information out of your prisoners, Felicity huffed. Unlike certain people, we are not animals. We are civilized and above such cruelty. Even with my helmet on, I can smell the shit that's coming out of her mouth, Wyatt thought, frowning. I'm pleased to hear that if I or any of those who follow me were to fall into your hands, Lady Felicity, we would be treated fairly, Clara replied gently, and Wyatt wasn't sure if she was being honest or if she was mocking the ebony-skinned woman across the table. My uncle surely is a practical, reasonable man. My Lord Genoch, I have passed unto you the official proposal sent by my brother the prince. You have rejected it, and thus now I shall speak of my own offer spoken with the full use of his authority, if you so give me permission to do so. Genoch made a motion with his hand a second later. My offer sees not many changes, I'm afraid, but it is better suited. 
the commercial pact stands offering a 20% increase instead of 15. You will also receive a privileged 0.05% wide tariff increase rate throughout all of your agricultural transactions for the duration of five generations of your bloodline and a five-year-long exemption in your yearly tax payments. And, most pointedly, your neutral stance shall not only be respected, but upheld. My demands are as follows. That you denounce the actions carried by my uncle, Duke Cornelius Draymore, as treachery, and that his standing as Lord Regent is both illegal and immoral. Every ally to my uncle is to be refused a proper welcome, but offer services and aid if need be at a 500 increased rate. That's absurd, said Maximilian in his booming voice. You may as well throw any unfortunate soul that winds up in Ferentis territory into the core of a star and spare them the humiliation. You're just trying to ensure that any wounded ship is forever anchored here until the conflict ends. In your defeat, I might add. Ah, you must be the acclaimed Maximilian Userek. Your face and armor seemed familiar, but I wasn't sure and didn't want to assume, Clara retorted with a small smirk. Under other circumstances, I would ask for your autograph. Alas, you are my enemy, esteemed lone wolf. An admirer? I'm almost honored, your majesty. Well, a fan is a fan, that's what I say. Who am I to deny you the grand opportunity of meeting me? Princess, enemies we may be, but only in the field of battle. It would shame me to rob you of the pleasure of owning my autograph, he declared, with dripping overconfidence and self-aggrandizement, as a lion's mouth opened its mouth to eject a golden paper with green trims. He took it, and after placing it on the table, he pointed his left index finger at the paper. A red laser erupted from the tip, the paper crackling but not bending or burning upon contact, and he quickly scribbled something on it. When he was done, he slid the paper at Clara, crossing the distance with ease. The honor is all yours, princess, he said, putting on his best toothy grin. Clara took the piece of paper with genuine glee and nonchalantly stored it within her dress. He's a lone wolf? Wyatt asked himself, surprised. He'd only read and seen a few lone wolves through videos or pictures, mostly in lectures. He knew lone wolves by reputation, all of them deadly and highly skilled men and women. In fact, most of his knowledge came from the man who was considered the first lone wolf, Luminor Tintar, a supremely skilled fighter pilot, a deadly warrior, an intelligence agent without equal, and a man credited with thousands of kills in his long, proud career that was the stuff of legend. He wasn't much for visual entertainment, but he enjoyed the movies made around the legendary Lone Wolf. Comparing Luminor Tintar to Maximilian Userek was unfair in his mind. The man was obviously strong and fit. Standing next to him, he doubted he could reach past his broad shoulders, but his expression and the air around him told him everything he needed to know. Maximilian Userek was a noble through and through. The arrogance was dripping from his cocky grin, and his eyes gleamed with barely contained mockery. His armor was of high quality and likely cost a small fortune, but it was flashy and unpractical. There was no doubt in his mind. He was before a noble that put his ego and pride before anything else. And yet Clara recognized him and wanted his autograph? Aren't lone wolves supposed to be incredibly talented warriors capable of going anywhere and do almost anything? He asked himself, his disappointment giving way to curiosity and wariness. As if reading his mind, which no longer surprised him that much anymore, Clara spoke up. Thank you kindly, Lord Maximilian. To be honest, I covet the autographs of the lone wolves that have caught my attention. You are most certainly among those few. Call it a silly whim of mine confessed the princess, a soft giggle escaping her lips at the end. I followed your career until you retired a few years back. A true shame. You were a most fantastic racer and dogfighter. Aren't we all? Maximilian replied with a laugh. My reasons for my retirement are my own, princess. But of course, Clara replied. It is saddening that you are our enemy, Lord Maximilian. I would have bought your services if possible. Your talents would be surely welcomed. Maximilian laughed again. I'm sorry to say, princess, that I would have rejected your offer. I do like my head attached to my shoulders, he said, not bothering to hide his insult. Besides, you got her with you, he pointed at Cynthia. Then he pointed at Wyatt. And you also got that one. You make a habit of keeping dangerous pets around. And unlike them, I am not a pet you can tame, princess.
Duly noted, the blonde woman replied. Turning to Genoc, she continued, Do forgive my lapse in courtesy, Lord Genoc, but I believe we needed a small break to refresh our minds and hold back our tongues. As much as I would like to continue tomorrow, my lord Genoc, I do not have the luxury of wasting your time, or that of his lordship, for very long. Fret not, for I too speak with the authority of his lordship. She waited a moment for dramatic effect, then pressed on. His lordship seeks no quarrel with House Ferentis. Therefore, the demand to be recognized as Lord Regent shall be dropped. In addition, the base price exclusivity shall be raised to 32%, and a formal pact of neutrality and non-aggression shall be signed. Will this entail that Third Fleet patrols are to be dispatched once more through their usual routes? Asked Yolti. Unfortunately, no. His lordship requires all available warships loyal to him to aid him in this conflict. Only those who support him directly and recognize his claim as Lord Regent are to be considered with the protection the Hammer of Draymore brings, Javier replied. Surely you understand his difficult position. Even our territories are bereft of the fleet's protection in these dire times. We simply have no ships to spare on simple patrol duties at the moment. If you were to support his lordship, who knows? Things may change in the coming months. I understand, Janik replied then turned to face the princess. Given the circumstances and the urgency all parties involved are facing, these dealings shall conclude today. Princess Clara, do you have a counteroffer? You require ships that we cannot spare. If my uncle lacks the numbers even with his tactical and strategical advantage to aid you without pushing you against a corner with no other options at your disposal, in that venue my brother, the prince, stands less of a chance to come to your protection in significant numbers. Everything I can do now is to increase the exemption on your taxes to ten years and respect your neutral stance with the signing of an official non-aggression pact. This is my final offer, she said, finally losing the edge of control in her voice. I see. If that's the best you can offer, your majesty, then I'm afraid I will have to reject you, Jeanock declared before opening the cylinder. It revealed a pristine white piece of parchment. Silently, he handed it over to Felicity, and she happily took it. She passed it to Javier, who produced a pen from within his uniform, and the man quickly began to scribble on the piece of paper. The room was silent for long minutes until Javier passed it to Felicity, who read it quickly, nodded, signed it, and then produced a signet from her bosom. The Ferentis son with dazzling hair, who had remained silent through the entire procedure, produced a candle and a lighter from his robes. He stood up and walked to Felicity's side, lighting the candle and dropping hot wax on the paper. Felicity used the signet to press the cooling wax for a few seconds, then pulled it back. The robed man then took the paper and handed it over to his father. Jeanock read it, nodded, and repeated the wax and signet process at the bottom of the paper. Rolling it up, he placed it inside the cylinder only to seal it after. This meeting is adjourned. House Ferentis shall retain its neutral position until this conflict is over, granting exclusive commercial rights on all agricultural goods and foodstuffs to neutral associates and Duke Cornelius Draymore's forces, Ishivi pronounced, standing up. Loyalty is its own reward. Loyalty is its own reward, everyone else chanted back. But Wyatt felt defeated, the words losing some of their weight as he spoke them. Clara extended her arms a second later and, moving in unison, both Cynthia and the pilot helped the princess to her feet. Congratulations on your victory, Lady Felicity. You have bested me fairly, Clara proclaimed, but her usual gentleness was lacking. As much as she tried to mask it, she had failed in her task and Wyatt sensed it. Something's off. This doesn't feel right, Wyatt thought, his eyes never leaving the princess. You fought well, Your Majesty. Your reputation does you justice, but alas, experience is everything, Felicity replied, unable to entirely hide the boastful joy in her voice. Now we shall take our leave. Oh, I almost forgot, princess, may I see the face of your black-clad warrior? Certainly, Wyatt, Clara replied. Wordlessly, Wyatt obeyed, detaching his helmet and showing his face and serious expression to the Draymore delegates. My, he's as handsome as I imagined. Heterochromatic eyes? Are they natural or gene-altered? She giggled, swaying her hips as she turned around. No matter, I suppose. Thank you for entertaining my curiosity, Your Majesty. And thank you, Sir Knight. 
Without you, my victory wouldn't have been possible, exclaimed the woman in a sultry tone before winking at Wyatt and walking away with her head held high. Wyatt, Clara said his name, putting pressure into it that he'd only heard when she was deadly serious about something. We shall talk in private. I, yes, of course, my princess, Wyatt replied, utterly confused by what was happening. What did Felicity mean by that? Was Clara angry at him? Lord Jeanak, I shall make use of my quarters for a little while longer, Clara added. Of course, my princess, I shall see you off in two hours from now, Jeanak replied. Silently, Clara walked out of the room and down the hallway, never speaking, never stopping. Wyatt glanced at Cynthia, but the blue-haired woman was also silent, and he couldn't see her face thanks to her helmet. But he couldn't feel any animosity coming from her, which only served to confuse him even more. What the hell had he done?